since I'm the independent, community independent federal member for INDI, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be joining you today in this amazing convention where we've got over a thousand people from right across this vast nation of Australia, uh, and we've got 125 electorates represented, which is, um, I'm told, quick maths, 83% of the 151 seats in the House of Representatives. So that's pretty blooming impressive. I'm absolutely thrilled to be hosting this se session today about connecting with community across rural and regional Australia. And I'm joined today by two total legends from rural and regional Australia, Alex Dyson and Susie Holt. So I want to kick off by saying a great big uh, community independent convention. Happy birthday to Alex Dyson, who is turning <laughs> 36 today. Happy birthday, Alex. Uh, you really know how to have a good time joining in with us today. Well, you should have seen me last night with the birthday cake. I closed my eyes, I blew the candles, and I wished that I would be on a, uh, have a good chat with Helen Holmes and Susie Holt, <laughs> would you believe? The the birthday wishes come yeah. through. <laughs> yeah, out here making the uh, the country a better place. Talking rural, it's a few of my favourite things all wrapped in one. I know, it's going to be great. So, a bit of an intro about this birthday boy. Alex grew up in Warrnambool and is known to many as a radio host who presented the Triple J Breakfast Show for six years from 2010 to 2016. He's a small business owner. In fact, he uh, owns a live comedy venue called Comedy Republic in Melbourne CBD. He's a published author of young adult fiction and a children's book. He's run twice for the federal seat of Wannan in southwest Victoria in 2019 and 2022. And fun fact, I was born in the electorate of Wannan. So I know this area really well. Uh, in <laughs> <laughs> I could can, I can probably connect you with a few people I know down there, Alex. Oh, please um, do, Helen. Yeah, yeah. In 2019, Alex's campaign was brief, but featured a rather unusual video. Now, if anyone knows how to put the fun into politics, it's this bloke where Alex presented his key policies by interpretive dance. Now, if you haven't seen this video, jump online after this session and Google it. The video received national and international media coverage. Alex subsequently, I'm not sure if it was his dance moves or his policies or both, but Alex achieved 10.3% of the vote in that state coalition seat in 2019 with the backing of Voices for Wannan, and he narrowly lost to Liberal frontbencher Dan Tian, uh, securing 19.29% of the first preference votes and 46.8%, and that 0.8 matters of the two candidates for a third count. So absolutely awesome work from Alex and his team, Voices for Wannan. So big, big welcome to you, Alex. Thank you so much. It's very nice to be here. I considered talking uh, to everyone today in interpretive dance, but I thought, you know, English sh should suffice for, <laughs> for this Zoom. <laughs> Good on you, Alex. And on screen with me is the fabulous Susie Holt. Uh, and Susie proudly ran as an independent in the Queensland seat of Groom, uh, uh, west of Brisbane, in the last federal election. Susie came second on the two-party preferred count behind the incumbent Liberal member. That hasn't stopped Susie from continuing to advocate for her community. She's out there. She hasn't stopped since the last election. Groom, for those of you who don't know it, is an agricultural electorate in the Darling Downs, taking in Toowoomba and the rural area west of that regional town. And I've got to say to you, Susie, I've got relatives up there too. This is rural oh. Australia. We're connected <laughs> everywhere. I'm Hello, I'm bring me on. <laughs> the farmer on the Darling Downs. So for Susie, she grew up in Brisbane, she studied social work, she's worked mostly in regional Queensland in health, mental health and aged care, and alongside with her husband, she's raised two daughters in that beautiful town of Toowoomba. She's committed to providing better federal representation for her regional area. From listening deeply to communities, Susie knows they value integrity, experience, local representation and a trust in science, and they want their representative to value them and their region. So. Folks, we've got two amazing people with us today. Um, I want to uh, really kick us off now by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from Bangarang country in Wangaratta in northeast Victoria in the beautiful electorate of Indi, 
which is 29,198 square kilometres, and I feel like I know every inch of it. Certainly, I change the tyres on my car regularly. I know that uh, that down in Wannan, that's an electorate uh, bigger than the size of Belgium. and yeah. uh, 33,500 square kilometres. <laughs> there you go, he Pretty good. me. <laughs> <laughs> and Susie's uh, around 5,000 square kilometres, and I know that we've got people coming in from Durac in Western Australia, the biggest oh, electorate of them all. So I want to really, you know, hone in on this challenge that we have uh, in connecting with our communities across such large geographical spaces. I think it's something that uh, is rather particular and special about being a community independent uh, out in the bush. So I'm really keen to hear from you, maybe first you, Alex, about uh, how how you managed during your two experiences in running for parliament, uh, how you managed your time in travelling across such large dis- distances and how you got an understanding of the different people in different communities in the various towns right across Wannan. Can you share with us what you've learned about that and how you've managed that? Yeah, I guess the the single word answer for how you how I manage my time would probably be poorly. <laughs> you know, you so you want to get out there so much and you're so eager as an independent, you don't have the campaign experience. I think all of us are getting involved is be, because we don't have the the background in campaigning and polling and like those kind of things. And so I think when you start it's very easy to get swept up in campaigning and um answer people's, you know, emails that come in, they ask for a visit and you end up, you know, driving three hours, having coffee with someone and driving back. And so it is, it is an interesting one having done it before. It is extremely valuable. I think the people who, um, who get the visit are so appreciative when you go through and you talk to them because you, the the different towns in these big electorates can be vastly different. And so you could have, you know, completely be talking about completely different topics and in different areas but it is interesting having done it twice now you know if i was to go a third time how you'd sort of structure your time and make sure that you're doing it the best you can because it can get expensive as well you know i probably two nights in the last campaign i stayed in the town that i was visiting the night before Uh, most of the other time i'd sort of finish a town hall in ararat and drive the hour 45 back to warrnambool or snake valley or uh, any number of places and so yeah it's it'd be interesting i'd be i'd be interested to to learn from susie about uh your method as to how you prioritize these sort of things but yeah it's something that you if you are running an independent campaign in a rural rural area um being sure to maximize the time spent you know, going between places, it would be absolutely massive because I did a lot of my own driving as well. And so uh, I think, yeah, you'd be a candidate on the phone or, you know, replying to emails in the back seat or the front, you know, passenger seat would be a, a lot more time valuable than, yeah, the the alternative as That's well. That's really good observation, Alex. And I'm going to bring you in a minute, Susie, on, on this one. But from my own experience, very much so, um, don't travel alone. Uh, have a volunteer as a driver, and it's a, it's a great job for volunteers to do. Lots of people love driving and are really keen to put their hand up to do that. You can get a lot of emails and telephone calls done while you're the passenger in the car, uh, so you can make the most of that travel time. And it's also a safety feature here too, guys. Like, it's really exhausting being a political candidate, and um, to be driving as well is is really a lot. And I think um, the other thing I would say is that it's really important to spend the time mapping out your electorate, understanding where the big population centres are, where the smaller ones are, uh, mapping out a schedule that you'll get around to everyone, but that you're not making um, trips backwards and forwards over vast distances when you could, in fact, plan it a bit better and and catch lots of little towns along the way. So... um, over to you, Susie. What have you What have you found in this? This it really is a challenge. It is a challenge. Thank you, Helen. Happy birthday, Alex. And um, before I begin, I just want to do a shout out to my team who are helping me behind the scenes, but also in the audience today. And I'm very proud of that team. Uh, look, Alex, we actually had to do that. I'm one. I'm dreadful at directions, and a lot of our country <laughs> are all country, and I will get lost. So we just, uh, toward the end of the election last year, we just gave up and I said, right, we had a driver. Also, use that time with your team so beautifully to talk about issues, what's really important, what's coming up, to plan how you're going to do. So we used it really strategically. 
But uh, it is when you go out to those regions you, to make the most of it and plan really well ahead. Sometimes that will change. You'll get out there and you'll realise uh, that beautiful country hospitality. So you've got to be flexible to say, yep, we're staying for lunch, even if we're doing a launch that night somewhere else. Uh, but certainly it's uh, making the most when you go out there. So you do a couple of events, try and see people in those little electorates. Uh, but also one of the things I love about when we head out west is handing ownership over to those people there to really bring them in. So say, look, we're coming out, whatever you would like to do, can you give us the timetable? Uh, can we work with you guys out there? And uh, can you, this is what we've got happening. We're happy to work around you. So when you bring in those communities, even if they don't know, know you very well they love it because they're so proud of what they've been doing um they're proud of you know their crop production what they've been doing out there their kids what they've been doing so it's actually really using those relationships and networks and bringing them in so see that's a really important point because i think that what we know is that we we know our own patch where we live really well um, yeah, but we can't can't presume in any way that we're going to know what the issues are in a town two or three hundred kilometres away. Um, so having the networks in those towns, having some key volunteers who set up uh, set up an event for you to come along to, uh, a, an event where you can listen and learn from the local people, and that that your key contacts in that town bring out the people who you need to meet. So, um, Alex, have you got any tips? For, uh, for us around how you managed to do that. How did you find key people in the in the towns across Wannan when, um, when you were campaigning in the last two elections? Um, it, a lot of it is is relying on the, the local people from those towns. You have one supporter, they know, inevitably know someone, those people know someone else. It's, um, yeah, it's pretty important to, yeah, lean on the, on the contacts that you have uh, who are, you know, supportive of, of a community independent who will be there and be listening to those people. And so, yeah, you know, a mixture of word of mouth and social media, you know, let people know ahead of time that you're coming to the town. And after you've left the town, posting photos and experiences of when you've been there is also really important because if people missed you, if they missed the news, they could catch up with it later. They know you've been there, you know, you can mention the things that you've done and you can do things like this, jump on Zoom and talk to people from that town later if they're, if they're catching up. Uh, the the rural electorates are a lot uh, different when it comes to, uh, I guess, local media as well. I think in one and there are, uh, someone said, 15 local newspapers around the entire electorate. It's not, you know, an inner city, you've got the Herald Sun and the Age, you know, and that's it. it it's a lot of those sort of things that, that are still really powerful in those areas. And so uh, what we did uh, is put in little, you know, ads that coming to town there'll be a meetup at this time at this place if you want to come along um alex the the member the sorry the independent candidate will be there if you want to raise some raise some issues or anything and so that alongside local radio also helps quite a lot in getting to those regional areas and another good thing i need to impress when you are driving around when it comes to planning make sure you plan your country bakery pie uh, because we all need <laughs> that on the road trips when we're going through you go in you make sure Sure that you're uh, you're sustained and vibrant, uh, pulling up to your next uh, community meeting. I think that's really great. And what you've just identified there is one of the key differences in rural and regional electorates, and that is the local media. So uh, I know in Indi, we're really fortunate. We've got multiple little newspapers. We've got community radio stations as well as our, our commercial radio stations. We've got FM. Uh, we've got uh, ABC and to get out on those radio stations and have a yarn um, with whoever's the presenter and and uh, advertise where you're going to be and at what time is a really great advantage, I reckon, of being a regional MP. And I think the other point you make, Alex, uh, and again, this, this speaks to budgeting for an election campaign, is budget for ads in the local paper and those ads uh, really can be focusing on where to meet you, where to, where to come and have that interaction. Uh, so it doesn't have to be an ad with, you know, necessarily with, a you know, a cute slogan. It can be a really informational ad about, you know, come meet your independent candidate at this time at this place. Again, uh, local volunteers putting on a morning tea or, or a lunch or something because people generally have travelled a long way, so really important. And I think the other thing I've just heard from you is that, element that we always want to weave into what we're doing in the community independent 
movement and that's kind of taking the fear away of participating in politics by having a bit of fun so you know setting up those little videos of, of the you know the the pie odyssey across <laughs> across Groom or across Indira across Wannan here I am again this time I've got a curry pie yesterday it was a steak and mushroom today it's a veggie whatever you know like you can make this stuff upright and it's mm. good fun but the critical part of it is why would you do that you do that because people see themselves in that. They see that local bakery. They see other people who are living in communities in, in the community just like they are, and it suddenly feels more personal uh, and 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 a friendlier place to engage with with a potential member of parliament. Hey, Susie, what about you? What 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 have you got to say about this? Well, Helen and Alex, I just love what you're talking about because I think part of our role as a regional independent is actually, well, one, I'm an advocate of regional journalism, so it's using our voices to actually tell the s- stories of local communities. So it doesn't always have to be political, but it's actually enabling us as facilitators or advocates to work with media to say, hey, there's this really great story out, out in this community. Let's use what we've got to actually share that and empower that community and give them some some opportunity just to put out what they're doing, which is wonderful. So it might be around we had Project School Formal that were collecting formal gear. So we actually gave a tip off to the local journalists to, hey, listen, there's, there's this great community event. Can you go out there? So he's building those relationships. But uh, more politically, one, I got online and I joined every community face group that I could join in those communities. They have terrific groups out there. Uh, that was interesting because that sometimes you remember the name of one of them, somebody. Susie. What a, what's an yeah, example so of the you, name of a community group? <laughs> so you're going to have the uh, 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 Oki. Uh, the, I think that's just what they call it, Oki Community Group. You're going to have um, all those little tiny groups in all the little areas. And you sort of get on, and that gives you a really good insight into what are issues are around. Even join the crime group because people are really concerned about crime. Uh, there's housing groups, so you can have a bit of fun on those groups. I've got one that sells fruit and veggies in Westbrook, and so they're sort of doing a bartering system. So that's terrific because you get to know what issues are, what people are talking about in those regions. The other thing that we did that. A lot of people, and I really encourage people in regional areas, is we go to the local commerce meetings. So wherever there's a chamber of commerce in those little towns, just jump on and go and sit as an observer uh, because they're talking about issues so relevant in those regions. It might be around how, you know, we're really tired of our community missing out on this, this, this. It might be transport. And it just gives you an in with those local communities so you understand. We actually paid up and became members of a lot of those little organisations. Also, they will give you a platform. So when they go around and say, oh, what are you coming here today? You can get up and say, oh, I'm Susie Holt. I'm running as an independent regional candidate. These are the issues that I'm hearing at the moment. Uh, So they might give you that platform. So it's a really wonderful opportunity to reach out and connect with communities that you may not often speak to. I think that's a fantastic idea, Susie. So I've, um, I, I wish I could see all the faces out there in, in, <laughs> in land, but, you know, I, can, I reckon there's a lot of heads nodding because it's a really good tip. I did a similar thing um, when I was running as a candidate, get out to the Chambers of Commerce, uh, yeah. uh, in, reach out to your local government areas. In Indi, I have nine, um, nine local shires, um, and I had the opportunity to go and meet with each and every one of them yeah. and uh, speak to the council. Uh, again, some of the, the vast electorates of WA or Northern Territory, you know, there may be a, a physical impediment to getting out to those local governments, but again, using technology, come online via a Teams meet. But make the ask, I think. I think you do yeah. need to make the ask of those organisations. Um, I think that... Uh, one thing I've just got a question in here or a comment in here, it's important to be across issues in smaller regional communities, particularly when the electorate is dominated by one large town or regional city. That's coming from Meredith who's listening and I think that's a really terrific point. 100%. Um, we know from the maths, um, 
if you're going to win an election, you have to you have to win the biggest towns, of course. Um, but that doesn't mean you can in any way ignore the smaller ones. And and what we're describing really is reflecting people back to themselves, uh, showing those people in those small towns um, that you see them, you know some of the fantastic things they're doing, which you just described, Susie, and you're sharing it in, in your social mm. media as well. Uh, and in doing that, you can also hear key key barriers uh, that they're facing in in um, maintaining or growing the particular project that they're, they're trying trying to do. So things like housing, things like transport, things like um, uh, availability of workforce, all of the things that we know are are, are, are quite a handbrake on regional economies. So. I want to know a bit about your volunteers. Alex, are you able to share with me uh, uh, a bit about the volunteer groups, a uh, group that supported you? How many people did you did you have on board helping you and, and what were the key activities that they were doing? Were they were they running events? Were they door knocking? Were they letterboxing? Were they phone banking? What were they? Were they at farmers markets? What were your volunteers doing? Yeah, a little bit of everything. We probably had a core group of about, I I guess maybe 10 that to, to that went through most of the campaign, which sort of grew and grew and grew to into, yeah, on election day, there was 91 booths in Wannan. And so we tried to have, I guess, six people at each one with teams of two over, you know, three shifts for the whole day. And so there's uh, a mix from just going to those to do doing a bit of door knocking to doing the bake sales to setting up at the, you know, wood wine and roses markets in Haywood with a little Alex Dyson gazebo where they could <laughs> tell people a little bit about, about the independent movement in one. And, um, and then you've got people who are just organizing the whole thing, the volunteer, um, wrangler i don't think that's the official term that's what i call them but is that's a really important job you've got the campaign manager who identifies the key people or the key groups you should uh talk to um and then you've got people who just really want to be involved and you can give them the license to set up some things there was a really great doctor in warrnambool young doctor who wanted to help out and he decided to set up a fundraiser for me which was a, a mario kart a competition and so people went down the pub they had uh the mario kart on the screen and we all played against it and he'd made a little trophy for the winner it was you know a 20 dollar entry and uh yeah that was a, a really nice and wholesome thing because then people who you know aren't attracted particularly you know particularly to a town hall meeting with alex dyson to discuss the major issues in our you know economy they can come down and play a bit of mario kart and then suddenly you're having a political conversation without even realizing it and so getting those sort of things in and you can only achieve those sort of things when we put a bit of trust in those in those volunteers or those people willing to help out and and something i find is just so at the very first time you talk to them, it's like ask them for how much time they've got available and what their strengths are. You know, the people will enjoy it more. They'll put more into it if they're doing things that they're really strong at. You know, if they're a bit more of a talker and a communicator, they could be in the volunteer section. If they're a bit more data orientated, you know, they, they're a bit more comfortable at home working, you know, working from home alone. You could put them on things such as, yeah, those organizational taking care of the website, you know. So there's um there's a people can do anything in those sort of communities but yeah talking to and identifying the strengths is is one that i definitely uh encourage people to do great alex so uh, you know people choose your own adventure i suppose and and lean into the strengths of the volunteers who are coming forward and and always that ask if you get one volunteer coming forward absolutely embrace them include them and then ask them to go and find two more you know like we we mm. constantly need to be growing uh growing our our numbers of volunteers and our networks um, before I go to you, Susie, I'm just throwing it out to the audience. If you've got any burning questions, send them in, please. I'm very happy to ask them of our, our fabulous guests. Susie, tell me about your volunteers. And, and, you know, we've touched on over this chat lots of mechanisms for getting out, getting ourselves known, um, turning up at, in small towns, using volunteers in our network to create events for us and opportunities to meet up with people. Tell me about your volunteer base and uh, you've continued this this huge odyssey that is <laughs> running to be a, a, a rural MP um, in between elections. How are you maintaining your volunteer base and what are they doing for you, with you? So for, uh, <laughs> sorry, Helen. Um, first of all, I do, and I know many of them are listening, I do want to put a shout out to our volunteers from last time because they are extraordinary because we had a very small but mighty team, and we had to be really strategic uh, because of our 
region in how we worked with the community and to bring in people. So, uh, Alex, I'm actually feeling like, oh, we need to do a dance-off. I'm thinking of all the things now that we can do across the regions. I'm going to put that challenge out to my team. <laughs> uh, but certainly last time we had a small but mighty crew, uh, I think it is using some things clever. So if we had farmers uh, put them strategically out in those farming communities and and uh, using them to have morning teas. We held a number of town halls uh, in areas. We had people opening up their gardens and their their properties to do events out there. But one of the biggest things is that you've got to keep volunteers motivated, keen, bring them in. So we have been trying to do pub events. We've been opening up our house to have barbecues once a month. So we bring in a guest speaker, someone local, and we talk about local issues. We've been bringing in people who have local businesses, so we're supporting local businesses as part of our campaign uh, to really throw open that fun element with music to say, you know what, we've got to create this space that's actually quite serious. You're talking about wanting to change the fabric of democracy and, and if we had more independent regional candidates down in Canberra, it truly would change the fabric of Canberra and I'm so committed to that. But within that element... And we are from Queensland. I often talk about the larrikinism and the um, the mischievousness and the sort of rat buggery sort of mischievousness of what we have to offer. So we do have to embrace that in the regions and say, you know what, we can be a bit mischievous and cheeky within a very serious element that we want to say, you know what, enough is enough, we miss out. And so how can we do that? So it might be, you know, let's meet at this coffee shop, grab a few you know, cheesecakes, whatever they are, and um, chat with locals. But it is being a bit risky. I think we have that opportunity to take a few risks as well um, and really lean into our regions to say, you know what, we can sort of get away with things that we mightn't do in the city. So um, certainly the pub events and politics in the pub and our barbecues have been wonderful. Couldn't yeah. agree more, Susie. One of the um, best compliments I got in the last campaign, this is the campaign you know, a few years after the uh, interpretive dance launch that I did, um, Gary from Peterborough said to me, he hadn't voted in 40 years, but he saw that interpretive dance video and he yep. said, yep, he is a normal person acting like a yep. moron and the rest of them are morons <laughs> acting like normal people. So I voted for him. And so <laughs> and I think country people, they get it. They understand that if you're being yourself, if you're being authentic and you're taking the issue yep. seriously, Seriously, but you're not taking yourself seriously. Um, yeah. There is room to be able to make politics a little bit more positive and a little bit more fun. Absolutely, so true. I couldn't agree more. We we have had uh, many a flash mob in India as well. <laughs> I think that um, people respond to this. They do think, "Oh, lunatic!" But um, yeah, and uh, and and get involved. But then, of course, at the end of that, there is that opportunity, as we all know that that familiar phrase, "While I've got gotcha, you." <laughs> um, and, yeah. uh, and then then it starts to come out, doesn't it? So, mm. hey, I've just got a question in um, asking us to uh, answer a little bit about what are the roles of volunteers in listening to community prior uh, to and during the campaign? And um, maybe I'll kick this off. I think that if you um, if you put your hand up to volunteer in, in one of these fantastic community independent campaigns, then once you're in, you're always in. Um, and in between campaigns, you're hearing things all the time, whether you've, you've prompted uh, by asking somebody a question or someone's come to you and you're discussing an issue. Um, volunteers can feed into us, can't they, um, in between elections? And I'm just wondering, um, Alex, do people from, from last time come to you now saying, hey, Alex, I'm hearing this uh, down in Colac? There's, you know, there's a whole bunch of people talking about this issue or, um, you know, maybe there's some folks in Tim Boone who, who are telling you something else. How do you find out from your volunteers what they're hearing in the community between elections? Yeah, I, I think that um, that channel of communication, communication heading up is super valuable. This is what I'm hearing. But it, I think it's also, I think it's also good. I don't think volunteers should be scared of, this is something I really encourage. I think it's being mini candidates. And that's what, you know, the, the the distances that we have to cover make it very difficult to get everywhere. And so, um, obviously, 
obviously making it uh, comfortable in that you don't want to talk out of turn. You don't want to do that. That's where a good training of your volunteers comes in. But once you do that, because, you know, the candidates and the campaign um, managers and these people are extremely busy, being able to take a bit of initiative and, and have the talking points and talk to people yourself and say, I'll pass these on and start doing a bit of persuasion rather than, you know, sitting back and and waiting for permission to do a few of these things. If you feel that you're trained up enough, if you feel like you know the talking points, um, I, I would I would encourage people to really be that mini candidate in that town, particularly if your candidate's not from the town that, um, you know, that, that you were from. You do have advantages over the candidate to go and start talking about those things, having those conversations yourself and then feeding it back to the campaign. And um, yeah, th I think people appreciate it. Yeah. To be able to do that and then bring a candidate out. And when, when it's, when they've got a little bit of time, I think that's something that would be really valuable and help. Yeah. These independent campaigns succeed. So volunteers listening, hearing, having conversations on the ground feeding it back to the candidate or campaign HQ or, uh, or whatever the mechanism that you've developed. And then once you've got a body of knowledge and uh, information, uh, perhaps setting up an event for the candidate to come and then really reflect back those issues that the volunteers have been listening to. And I think the point you made there, Alex, about volunteers admitting candidates, uh, and it's it's kind of true. I mean, that that's a scary concept in some ways to, to some folks. And I often say to our volunteers, you know, it, it's not about telling people stuff, it's about listening to what they've got to say and feeding it back through. Um, but you can't underestimate the power of a local person being an amazing referee for the candidate. So, you know, that that has enormous power. If, if a volunteer in my community says, I think Helen's great, um, mm. their credibility as a person in that community is is uh, is really very, very powerful. Anything for Because I feel the movement, the community independent movement is a lot bigger than myself as, you know, Alex yes. Dyson for one. You know, I'd love to have someone, you know, any candidate as an independent. They've got such an advantage and the power is not come from me as a candidate. It comes from the community community changing their vote and showing Canberra that if they're not getting, you know, a good deal, if they're getting taken for granted, that they are willing to vote differently. And so, yeah, when you're, when you're volunteering, yeah, keeping that, the movement even above, above the candidates is, um, is something that can. So true. Yeah, you know, we're the, we're the flag bearers as the candidate. And, you know, I often say, um, the seat doesn't belong to, like, the seat of Indi doesn't belong to me, Helen Haynes, um, current member. The seat belongs to the people of Indi. And uh, I think it's really critical to know that you're representing something bigger than yourself. Absolutely true. Um, I was going to go to you on the same question, Susie, but I'm, I'm, I've got a question coming in from um, from our listening uh, listeners out there, and I'm conscious of the time. Um, so I want us to, to go to this. I'm going to ask you this straight up. How much does climate come up in rural electorates and how do you respond? What, what are people saying about climate um, up in, in uh, around Toowoomba, Susie? So we've actually made climate one of our pillars uh, for the next campaign because we have a huge agricultural industry and we need to look after that industry. It brings a lot back into our economy and we want it there for future generations. So... What we've seen is a shift where people were very nervous to talk about the climate. Suddenly, all of a sudden, uh, given the changes, I think the changes down in Parliament, the changes locally, and also what we did last time. So we created that space. We changed the narrative. So we've opened up the freedom for people to start having these conversations. Also, some of our big industries in town are uh, now are taking on board because they see the economic advantages of sustainability and what that's going to bring to local industry and manufacturing. So they're actually leading the way. So we've actually been able to lean into that, jump on board. So whilst it is climate, we always bring it back to local issues. So one is that, well, what can we do around manufacturing? So you, you talk to people in those areas of interest. It might be around green cement and then we've got a whole group of farmers. And, Alex, I could not agree with you more. It is about radical trust. It is about empowering and advocating for communities and letting them take your their, your voice, but carry that voice onwards. So our farmers want a future and they want a future for their region and not also for the nation. So climate comes into to those local local regions and using those issues specifically to talk a to talk about it, but we've got a new generation coming through, including my daughters. 
where climate is important and they are coming out and they have been given this incredible opportunity to speak and it's still a big issue. So we're having a discussion now talk about it. Great, Susie. So again, talking about climate through the rural lens of how your local people are experiencing opportunities and change. What about you, Ali? And again, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So we had a bit of a bit of a watershed moment talking. I was getting interviewed last campaign from a you know inner city podcast talking about that and wondering why climate isn't important to rural people. I sort of asked that. And I think from my experience, it's it's not that climate isn't important to rural and regional communities. It's just I think people in the city, a lot of their needs are met. You've got better roads, better public transport, yes. the education opportunities are great, the healthcare opportunities are great, you know, you've got mobile phone reception. Uh, when you're out at the regions, those kind of daily witnesses of not being taken care of, the potholes, you know, the fact that you can't get to a doctor, those really bubble to the surface. And it's not that regional communities don't care about climate change. It's I think the mindset is it's more of a given. It's like, yes. Well, yes, we all agree. Stop yep. sort of ramming it down our throats a little bit here. We have some things that need to get in place before we can focus on these sort of bigger climate issues. And so, yeah, it's not so much a scepticism of climate change that I, I, I pick up when I'm talking to regional communities. It's more of a, there are some extremely pressing issues we would love to have looked at first such yes. as cost of living when we go to the supermarket and the fact that petrol now, because I'm driving big different distances, is a lot more expensive. I, I, I pick up that and it's uh, it's really seeing it as that really well-meaning r- rural and regional communities that um that have it abs climate in mind. I think every campaign should have climate as a big pillar that people are there, but it, it should also have a really big focus on on getting these regional and rural communities to the same living standards as the, as the people in the, the inner metro areas. All right. I uh, absolutely agree with you there. Uh, there are many, many challenges. Cost of living, as you say, is foremost in people's minds at the moment. Uh, and the lens through which we see climate change is also a lens, I think, that rural and regional Australians see through regional development more broadly. Um, we're at the end of our time. Gosh, that went fast. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry if there's some questions out there that we didn't get to, but such is uh, such is the, the, uh, the way these shows have to run. Um, it's been an Absolute delight uh, speaking with you, Susie and Alex, today. And I thank all, all our listeners. Uh, lunchtime, uh, the late lunchtime breakout opportunities. Find your tribe. Find those other rural and regional communities to chat to, uh, and make plans. Uh, make plans to connect and to set yourselves up in a way uh, that you can really apply the learnings from today. So uh, thank you very much. I think that uh, I'm over to Alana Johnson. Yes, I'm here. Can we both be in the screen, Helen, or I reckon it work? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. We're with a team like this. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> very close together. Um, it's been a fascinating uh, conversation. So Alex and Susie, thank you so much. And Helen, Pleasure. for moderating that and bringing all of that forward. Um, it really flows well into our next section, which is about doing the work. And when you talk about doing the work in our big rural and regional electorates, we all know what that means. So I'm I'm looking forward to hearing from Ella Finlay from Wentworth, from Connell Feeney from Kuyong, and Joyce Wan from North Sydney, and um, and focus on doing the work. Terrific! Thanks, everyone, and good luck. This is exciting. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Ella. Thanks for everything. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, Alex. Bye. Bye, Lana.